good stuff. Yeah, what do we got here? Motor. It's like a. Ooh. This is, this is just like a tease. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> What's in here? Is that one of those monkeys? <laughs> Yeah, let's get this thing out. It looks like you said, Tim, there's a nut on the back side. Yes, sir. Right on the bottom there. Cool. Yeah. This one there is not. <laughs> that one was not a nut on the back side. Well, we got the motor right there. We're waiting for some parts to put the motor kind of together and then put it in the car. While we're doing that, while we're waiting for parts, I got all the parts for plumbing the brakes. There's a bunch of bulkhead fittings. These are adapters from the caliper to a AN lines, NPT eighth inch to a dash three. And here's a bunch of AN lines. G&J Aircraft and Fittings in Ontario did a great job on putting these together for me. And now I gotta organize all of them, sort them out. I actually have a, a document online that Carlos and I have been sharing as we're putting this car together and I kind of laid out all the brake lines, fittings, uh, lengths and where they go on paper on that document. And I'm gonna go off of it and hopefully the lines that I ordered based off of my measurements will fit the chassis well and hopefully everything plumps together. So we started by drilling some holes for the bulkheads here and let me show you. This is a bulkhead for the front Break. So it's going to go from the pedal box through the firewall down here through the wheel well and it ends up being right there. And now we got to snake that to the caliper. So a lot of bulkheads and then connecting the dots, uh, pedal box to the firewall, firewall to the wheel well, wheel well to the brake caliper and so on. We got to do that obviously for the front. That has to be done for the OBP Motorsports fun stick handbrake from the handbrake to the reservoir uh, pedal box has three master cylinders clutch front brake rear brake these are already plumbed to the reservoirs now we're gonna have to take the pressure side which is right here and plumb each pressure side to go you know for example the clutch it's gonna go to the trans tunnel bulkhead down into the bell housing which is right here and into the slave cylinder that's inside the bell housing. So it's a lot of connecting the dots. I'm going to get to it and uh, hopefully it goes smooth. We're wrapping up the brakes here. Carlos is uh, assembling our rear calipers, man. These Wilwood calipers are awesome. I'm using the same caliper for the hydraulic handbrake and the foot brake. And it is a bolt-on affair after you put some uh, Bank Industries brackets on it. These basically allow you to adapt the caliper to the S chassis to the Weiss Fab knuckle, which is right here. And look at this rotor. This thing's amazing. So this is a floating rotor. It's actually got uh, where it's bolted. There's actually a little bit of play there, and uh, it's very thin. It's not vented. The reason we went with such a lightweight rotor is because this is unsprung weight. This is weight that the shock has to deal with. Uh, hub, rotor, the knuckle itself is actually very light. It's, it's very hollowed out. Weissfab makes a very lightweight knuckle. And the less unsprung weight we have, the faster the shock could react and move. So we definitely want to cut down unsprung weight. That's why we're using a drag race rotor in the rear. It's very lightweight and thin. So we got the brake lines pretty much in. There's a few brake lines that we're gonna have to modify. It's uh, kind of unknown when you measure stuff and then you put it in, you kind of find a better way to do it, a better way to plumb it. But here's a, a view of the front brake lines. They're in. We just ran a bulkhead right to the, uh, inside the wheel well from the factory. There used to be a mount that hung here and the brake line would come out here. But obviously um, with Weissfab, like the amount of angle we get the like literally the wheel would take out where the brake line would come out from the factory so we have to move everything aside here's a good look of the rear you got the wheelwood caliper for the handbrake 
This is for the foot brake, and uh, this picks up in the factory location. We had to make one here because obviously from the factory there's no handbrake, um, not a hydraulic handbrake. So yeah, super stoked the way it came out. It's really clean. I think it'll be nice and easy to work around. And oh yeah, let me show you the pedal box. So here's a view of the pedal box with the lines uh, hooked up. I haven't hooked up the clutch line yet. That's one that I'm probably gonna mess around with a little bit. I'm not so sure where I want it to go through on the transmission tunnel. I do want it to go into the transmission tunnel on the side. So that way on the other side, it's like a really quick jog right to the bell housing. I always wanted to do that. And now that I have a floor mounted pedal set, it's gonna be, I think the best way to do it. So yeah, I'm just working here, trying to finish this up, trying not to bleed on my car too bad. <laughs> just, uh, it happens though. So brakes almost done, gotta run to G&J. One more time to get one brake line modified and then that should be it. So we got this slave cylinder that sits inside my bell housing and this one's been hammered a bit. I've used it. I don't know how many hours it's kind of been in this part spin as a spare, but the bearing's a little blown out and who knows how good the seals are inside of this thing. So we're going to go ahead and rebuild this thing. We got a new oil seal for it, a new wiper seal, as well as the bearing itself. We're going to tear this thing down, put all this new stuff in it, first clean it out, and then put it all back together. tell there's a lip and there's a lip inside of the bearing and they basically just seat into one another until it bottoms out on the actual lip right here. Basically this acts like a like a piston. It's like the piston area that you have to work with. The seal's in there. The seal's literally pushing this up and down. So bam done. The breather is the top port. The oil pressure feed from your uh, brake pedal from the master cylinder comes right in here. So as this gets uh, fluid being pushed in, fluid has to go somewhere, it displaces this. So this lifts up as, as you push the clutch pedal in. And uh, the diaphragm of the clutch is uh, obviously spring loaded. So as soon as you let go of the clutch pedal, the diaphragm pushes this thing right back. And if you need to bleed the system, the bleeder attaches to here, just like a caliper. Uh, this is at the highest point, so air could escape because air always rises. So yeah, this thing's ready to go, cleaned up. We got the new motor in, but we need some stuff for it, like uh, some sensors, pilot bearing, a few other odds and ends, and I just don't want to put it in quite yet because then we're going to have to work around it being in the car, getting those last bits and pieces on but we do need a motor in there to finish up a little bit of the plumbing and get some of the wiring routed the way we want it, which means I have to run down to a store, get some uh, lines made up and also get uh, some like ground strap cable and some uh, alternator cable made. So we're gonna throw the old motor in, actually that's one of the spares, just for a little bit and hopefully it's the last time we're putting a mock-up motor in this thing, but it's really holding us back and we don't have all the stuff for the new motor just yet. So we're gonna throw that thing in there, mock up the last few bits so I can run out and get some more parts, finish plumbing it, pull that old motor out, dress the new engine over the next couple days and hopefully new motor going in. Carlos, what's the one thing in a 240 that you need to absolutely put in before you can put the motor in? I'll give, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the steering shaft. That's hint number one. One, really? thing, one thing has to be in there before the motor could go in. He's been working on BMWs with that last, so we're, 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 we're getting you know what acquainted. You the sad thing is that I've done a couple of 240s with LSs and I'm coming out. Oh, the header has to be mocked up before you drop the engine? The, no, so the header is actually one of the primaries goes around. Okay. So we got to pull this thing off and the header literally needs to sleep over the steering shaft. Yeah. 
because once the motor is in there, uh, there's no way to really do that. So that's the one thing I learned from early, early on of LS swap 240s. So yeah, we got to grab one of these stainless headers and put that thing on first. And it's just the driver's side that has this kind of unique thing. So this is how it goes. So yeah, if you guys are swapping an LS into a 240 with a stock uh, rack or uh, similar to stock steering shaft, make sure to to sleeve the steering shaft through the header. Take, that Take the joint off. Yeah, I mean, it might clear. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, if you pay attention to that tip, you'll save yourself a bunch of time. So the first time I did it, I put the motor in. And then I started putting the headers on, and uh, no, <laughs> the motor had to come right back out for that driver's side header. And tip number two when you're throw, throwing an LS into a 240 is if your motor already has spark plugs on it, like our spare does, pull those suckers out because what's going to happen is as you're putting it in, yeah, you, you could totally put it in with the spark plugs on, but when you're fighting the exhaust, the spark plugs might get nicked just a tiny bit and you won't really see it there's going to be a hairline fracture in the actual uh, porcelain part of the spark plug and you'll get your motor fired up running and you're going to be chasing some sort of random misfire issue and you're going to blame other things like wiring or uh, the tune or something like that but chances are you might have just nicked it on the headers while you're putting it in and especially when you're putting the passenger side header in after the motor's in it's a bit of a tight fit and if you just nick the spark plug with the header bad news so a bunch of parts are coming in and we got this ls7 stock intake manifold in which is what I'm gonna be running. Unfortunately, right out of the box, this vacuum port was broken. So honestly, I didn't wanna use that vacuum port. It goes to the brake booster. We're not running a brake booster here. So I think what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna shave that all the way down and we're gonna run an eighth inch NPT tap through there and just put a nice little plug on it and then it'll be cleaner and we'll obviously solve this piece because if we don't have this uh, fixed, this nice LS7 intake manifold is useless. So hopefully that works. So we drilled it and got a tap that we ran through here. It's an eighth inch NPT. So far so good. Boss man's not happy though. What's up Adam? What's going on bud? So we got the hole drilled, tapped, and now the plug is in there. It's an eighth inch NPT plug. Actually looks, looks pretty good. And what's cool is that it's nice and flush. So we no longer have this thing sticking out. I think it looks a lot, a lot better than having this with a plug on it. I'm kind of stoked that it broke. It looks way better. I've been working a lot on this thing and haven't had a chance to pick up the GoPro and kind of go over the stuff that we're doing because it's rush mail trying to get things done. So we got the new gear set in. I installed it into the transmission and it's about ready to go back together. Here's the cover, but I wanted to show you guys how these things work. So these are two shift forks, which are attached to a shift linkage that goes to your shifter. And what happens when you shift is you're literally sliding this slider to engage one gear set back to neutral, engaging the other gear set back to neutral. So that's third, fourth, I believe. Uh, and then you got first and second so you engage it one direction neutral is the middle the other one and the reason these are called dog boxes is because they don't have synchros instead of synchros they have dogs and these uh, these little dog rings right here are what engage the gear sets instead of synchros and you can see the distance between each dog is quite large and that's why you kind of get that clanky large backlash with a dog box race transmissions because you have such a big distance between here. There's literally a lot of backlash uh, until each dog engages. So it's kind of noisy and clunky. It would be for a street car, but that's what allows us to shift very quickly 
and that's what we need in a race car. Other than that, we got a lot of parts that are coming in and it's all over the place here. We're literally opening up boxes every single day and putting this thing together. The new Texas Speed motor is finally in the car and we're still hooking things up. The Holly EFI harness is on the car. You can see the injectors are hooked up. We're still waiting for valve covers from Texas Speed. The uh, Dutchworks injectors are installed. Holly fuel rail. This bad boy from Vortec is installed and we are trying a serpentine belt instead of a cog belt this year. Uh, we'll see how it goes. There's pros and cons to running a cog belt versus, versus a, a rib belt, like what we're gonna try to run right here. So the rib belt has a little bit of slip. It's a little more forgiving on all the accessories. It's more forgiving on the crank, definitely more forgiving on the supercharger. When we're on rev limiter, the belt gets shocked very hard. So I'm hoping that a little bit of slip there is actually gonna be a good thing and maybe the belt will last longer. The cog belts are very expensive and sometimes we go through several in one round. So it ends up being kind of costly and one more thing to really keep an eye on. So hopefully with this belt being a little more forgiving, the belts will last longer and it's gonna be something that we don't have to spend so much energy and time paying attention to. We'll see how it goes. I'm gonna give it a rip on the test day. We'll have it on the dyno. We'll have the cog belt as backup to switch back to if this doesn't work out. So really excited about getting all these uh, parts installed, but at the same time, very stressed out because as we put this thing together, we realize we're missing this part or that part. I literally have probably parts from three different suppliers coming in uh, overnight right now to make it here for tomorrow so we can keep chugging on this thing, keep plugging things in. Um, that's what it takes. I'm trying to really hurry up and put this thing together now. I'm kind of in inducing crunch time now so I don't have to deal with it when it gets close to Long Beach. Hopefully we get this all out of our system now, get the car tested, and then I could go into Long Beach knowing that I have something that works. There's still going to be a few bugs to work out because we're trying a few different things, so we've got to start that early. Lots of work still to do, and uh, hopefully we can get this thing all together uh, by the weekend.